Hare Krishna. There's one particular bhajan that is very nice. It was the bhajan favorite of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and Srila Prabhupada. Also, was very fond of it. And that is called Nama Kirtana, which we know as Yasomati Nandana. So if you have your phones, you can follow along. It's called Nama Kirtana. It's easy to find and easy to follow. Iya somati nandana braja varanagara gokula ranjana kahana Yaso Mati Nandana Gajabara Nagara Gokula Anjana Kahana Gopi Parananda Mata Mano Gopi Parananandanam Madamanoha Kali Adamana Vidana Kali Adamana Vidana Namiya Vilasa Hamala Hari Nam Namiya Vilasa Vipina Purandara Namina Nagara Vara Vamsi Vadana Su Vahasa Hey, Vajjan of Fallen, Sudakula Nasana. Vajjan of Fallen, Sudakula Nasana. And Nanda go under Vindavana, not the 
Sumati Nandana, Brajabhara Nagara, Gokula Ranjana, Kana, Krishna. <laughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 14 The Disappearance of Lord Krishna, Text Number 40 Kachit Nabi Hato Bhavai Sabdadi Bir Amangalai Nadatam uktam artivyam asayayat patishrutam kachidnabi hato bhavai sada dear beer amangalahai Nadatam uktam artibya asayayat patishrutam kachid nabi hato bhavai sadabdibir amangalai nadatam uktam artibya Asayayat Patishrutam Thank you. 
Ladies? Mm -hmm. Any ladies? No ladies. Okay. Kachit. Weather. Na. Could not. Abihata. Addressed by. Avavai. Unfriendly. Sabda adibihi. By sounds. Mangalai. Inauspicious. Na. Did not. Datam. Given charity. Yuktam. Is said. Arti. Artibya. Unto one who has asked. Asaya. With hope. Yat. What. Patisrutam. Promise to be paid. So here we have uh, Yudhisthira Maharaj is questioning Arjun. Arjun has just returned from Dwarka and Krishna has just recently departed the world. Arjuna is in a very despondent, unhappy, very morose state of mind. And he's appearing before Yudhisthira, his older brother. And Yudhisthira is asking him questions. Why he is so despondent looking. So he asks these questions in the form of rhetorical statements. So here is one of the statements. Has someone addressed you with unfriendly words or threatened you? Could you not give charity to one who asked? Or could you not keep your promise to someone? So he's making these three questions. Could it be you were somebody threatened you with unfriendly words? You failed to give in charity when it was required and uh, you couldn't keep your promise. And Prabhupada's very short purport. A kshatriya or a rich man is sometimes visited by persons who are in need of money. When they are asked for a donation, it is the duty of the possessor of wealth to give in charity in consideration of the person, the place, and the time. If a kshatriya or a rich man fails to comply with this obligation, he must be very sorry for this discrepancy. Similarly, one should not fail to, give his, to keep his promise to give in charity. These discrepancies are sometimes cause of despondency, and thus failing, a person becomes subjected to criticism, which might also be the cause of Arjuna's plight. Hmm. salakaya <laughs> Chaksun militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha shri chaitanya banobistam staptitam yena bhutale swayam rupa kadam mayam dadati swam padati kam jai sri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri advaita gadadhar shivasari gor bhaktavrindam hari krishna hari krishna 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 hari 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 Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So in the scriptures it mentions that there's three things you should always be satisfied with and there's three things you should never be satisfied with. The three things you should always be satisfied with is food, money, and wife. You should always be satisfied with whatever food comes, whatever money comes by normal ways, and you should always be satisfied with your wife. Hare Krishna. Okay? Write that down. <laughs> it's very important. 
And uh, the three things you should never be satisfied with is you should never be satisfied with chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. You should never be satisfied by hearing the glories of the Lord. And you should never be satisfied in giving in charity. In other words, you should continue to hear the glories of the Lord. You should continue to chant the Hare Krishna Mantra, mantra and you should always be giving in charity. In other words, these things you never stop, you continually do. So here we're hearing about a Kshatriya. Arjuna is in a, he's a Kshatriya. He's a warrior. Kshatriyas, they have three main duties. One is to protect the innocent against unscrupulous persons who might cause harm. Shat triya, shat means harm, and triya means to give protection. So they are protectors and expert fighters. So it's a class of people who have that acumen, you might say that ca characteristic, is they like to give protection. And it's mentioned that there are five types of persons who require protection. The cows, the brahmanas, women, children, and older people. These first five people should always be given protection at all times. And one who fails, and one who has a responsibility, and fails to take care, give protection to these persons, they are also implicated in um, what we say uh, wrong actions. In other words, they will also be victimized by not taking care of those that they're supposed to take care of. Children, women, old people, cows, and Brahmins, these five, they require protection. So that's one of the duties of a Kshatriya. The other duty is management, to manage. They are good at organizing and they have to manage whatever they are in charge of, whether it's a yatra, a temple, an army, a force, something. They are good managers. And the third thing is that they are meant to give in charity. As leaders, they collect charity from their followers, and then they take that charity and give it back in the form of necessities that people need in order to live properly. So Kshatriyas are usually rulers, heads of state, you might say, persons who are in a position of leadership and are responsible, take care of those they are leading. So one of their duties is to collect charity, not for their own interest, but to collect charity and then bring it back to the persons in the form of necessities. So here, it's being questioned by Yudhisthira. Arjun, did you fail to give in charity when asked? <laughs> and so th that is a discrepancy, as it's been pointed out here. So that is a requirement. And if one is in the position, so Srila Prabhupada expands on this point, that if one is in the position to give charity to others, and if some needy person comes and you fail to give charity, you will be very sorry. <laughs> Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was traveling with his Grihasta disciples. They were all family people. And they were going to different holy places. So they, had, where they were at one holy places where many of these, what we say, people who live by begging, they had come to to these devotees to get some bakshish. <laughs> and they asked for bakshish. But the grihastas didn't want to give anything. They refused. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, who was there, he immediately chastised them. He said, if you do not give in charity, you will become hard-hearted. And hard-heartedness is the opposite 
of a Vaishnava. A Vaishnava is by nature soft-hearted. <laughs> Hard-hearted means insensitive to other people's concerns or needs. <laughs> so Bhakti Siddhanta you know, took issue with those persons and of course they immediately started to give in charity. So therefore in giving in charity also one should know how to give in charity and Prabhupada points that out here. He says well, it should be done according to the person, the place, and the time. So it's not that all charity is given in the same way. These are the three considerations. Who is receiving it? What is the time that it's being given? And what is the circumstance by which the, the charity is being offered? Mm -hmm. So these things are also consideration. We see in India there are a whole class of people who live simply by begging. And um, that is their livelihood, it's considered a occupation. <laughs> it's considered to be acceptable and these people are meant to receive something in order to carry on. Of course some of them are cheaters, obviously. <laughs> who take up this occupation because they want, they don't want to do any honest work. But still, what can you do? But there are a class of people who are, cannot do anything and require to live by the mercy of others. Just like what we do here in, in Chaupati is that we carry prasadam everywhere we go. And when people come for bakshis, we give prasad. And that is a very good form of uh, donation because one gets purified, one gets mercy, simply by receiving and taking prasadam. So it's a woman. And that will prevent any un wrong use of giving money to persons who are not qualified to receive. In Western countries, it's not such a, uh, what we say, a familiar thing. You don't see this so much. But there are people who do go out and they stand by the stoplights and the cars stop for the red lights and they come to the windows and we usually give them some food. Sometimes we give them some donation. So it's not so common. But giving in charity is actually a qualification or a characteristic of a, of a saintly person. Just like the six activities of a, Brahma, a Brahmana is patam patan yajan yajan dana pratigraha. To know the scriptures, to teach the scriptures, to worship the deity, and to teach others how to worship the deity, to accept charitable gifts, and to give in charity in response. So Brahmins live simply by receiving charity and then putting that charity back into the society for the benefit of the society. Also the Kshatriyas also. But the Kshatriyas are not allowed to take any personal uh, remuneration from the charity they receive. The Brahmins can do that. <laughs> That is the difference. The Kshatriyas have to have their own means of livelihood. They cannot take anything given to them that comes by way of charitable gifts that has to be used for the benefit of others. So here, uh, Arjuna is being questioned. Did you fail to give in charity? And because of that, were you criticized by others for, for not responding properly? So that was a pretty strong statement by, by uh, Yudhisthir. It was pretty accusing, but he could see that there is such despondency in the mind of, of uh, Arjun that there must be something seriously wrong. He still hasn't come to the understanding that Krishna has left the planet, and that is the actual cause of Arjun's despondency. 
Another thing is here is one should not fail to keep his promise. Sometimes we see, just like when we uh, give initiations, the spiritual master is there, and the candidates coming up to get Diksha initiation are sitting in front of the fire, and there is Yagya. The fire represents Lord Vishnu, and the assembly of devotees represents the Vaishnavas, and the, uh, the spiritual master is there, and everything is there, and people come up and they promise that they will chant 16 rounds every day and follow four regulative principles for the rest of their life. So that's a promise, but that's not a promise, <clears throat> that's a vow. If you make a promise to someone, if circumstances do not allow for that promise to be carried out, that may be an excuse not to keep your promise. And you're not, what we say, faulty for that. But if you make a vow, <laughs> A vow is a promise that has such strength to it. It's something that is like imbreak unbreakable. You can't break a vow. <laughs> if you break a vow, you suffer <laughs> automatically. So initiation is a time where we take vows in front of the fire, in front of the guru, in front of the Lord, in front of the assembly of devotees to chant 16 rounds on beads every day without fail and to follow the four principles no illicit sex, no intoxication, no gambling and no meat eating and if one makes that promise then as Srila Prabhupada said one should never break that promise because it's such a serious commitment and, but the point is, it's for the benefit of the person who makes the promise and not so much for everybody else. Everyone else can also benefit if persons follow. But if people don't follow, and there, this happens sometimes that devotees make that promise and for whatever reason, because you'll see that life has a tendency to change, right? What was important at one time in your life is not important anymore. Or what was not once not important is important. And things change, people change, situations change. And that's just the way life is. But when you make a vow, you can't change. <laughs> so circumstances may cause us to think differently because of the change. But when it comes to vow, no. Therefore, it says that if you break the vow of not chanting 16 rounds a day after committing to that, you suffer. You go down. But if you break the vow of not following the four regulative principles, not only do you suffer, but your spiritual master also has to undergo some suffering. Mm -hmm. So that's really because the spiritual master agrees at the time of initiation to do whatever he can by his spiritual prowess to take that disciple back home, back to the spiritual world. And so that is his responsibility to his disciples. And the responsibility of the disciple is to simply carry out the instructions of the spiritual master. And the foremost is to chant 16 rounds and to live by these four, avoid these four regulative principles. In Kali Yuga, everybody breaks these principles. I'm not saying devotees, but people in general do not have an understanding of how sinful these activities are. They cause great distress to one who commits it and to others who are reconnected with that person. So these four regulative principles, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating and no gambling, if one follows or restricts themselves from them, one becomes completely sinless. Mm -hmm. Because all sinful activities sit within those four activities. 
So if one can follow those strictly their whole life, they will become not only pious, but a very elevated in spiritual life. And of course, chant Hare Krishna. So it's so important. Because the scriptures really give very strong emphasis how dangerous it is to break these principles. And the whole materialist society simply finds satisfaction or some kind of happiness in living according to the, these principles, illicit sex, intoxication, meat eating it, and gambling. I remember when I we first came to India back in the 1980s. My first time in India was in 1986. That was almost 36 years ago. Um, even people in the common society weren't breaking these principles. People were pious, people were generally religious. Very few people, maybe a few people ate meat and a few people were not up to the standard. But as time goes on, we see as the influence of the Western sinful society has come into India in such a strong way that now these four regulative principles are not even considered to be important anymore. That's that I'm not talking about devotees, I'm talking about people in general. Uh, because people think, oh, this is the way to enjoy life. But it's sinful, and you can't enjoy sinful things. You can enjoy things that are meant for your enjoyment, and that is service to the Lord, service to the devotees, service to people in general, and living a life that helps to bring about God consciousness to yourself and to others, and to do good to others. Uh, our movement is called Paropaka. Paropaka means to do good to others. And when people live a sinful life, how can they think about doing good to others? Because they're always thinking about how they can enjoy. One has to be at least be pious before they can understand the benefit of spiritual life and then ultimately take to Krishna consciousness. But if people are sinful, then the whole society goes to hell. <laughs> and Prabhupada talks about, and not only Prabhupada, but it's mentioned in the scriptures that meat eating, especially eating meat, which means to cause another living entity to get killed in order for someone to enjoy some kind of taste. So that is called, that's, that's a very high sense of cruelty. I want to taste something and another person, another living entity has to suffer and give up their life so I can enjoy my tongue. That's very sinful. Therefore, that type of uh, sinful activity has great effect upon the society and it causes so many problems, not only for the people involved, but for society in general. Therefore, it's mentioned that meat-eating, cow-killing leads to war. Because when you kill cows or any living entities unnecessarily, you're getting karmic reactions that are heavy. And when a society accepts that as a way of life, that karma builds up. And therefore, the people in the society, especially the young men, they have to go to war and fight and give up their lives just as a reaction for that sinful activity. That's how heavy meat-eating is. <laughs> so Prabhupada said when one is engaged in meat-eating, they, they're actually really falling low in the quality of human life. And so one should be very concerned that people follow Krishna consciousness because you can't give up sinful life unless you take up spiritual life. 
To be pious in this age is very difficult without being devotional because society doesn't let you. <laughs> it's not possible. It's very hard. It's possible for very, very few people who are very determined but very difficult to follow. Therefore, one has to take seriously take up spiritual life and then one develops all the right activities on all of good qualities. Because spiritual life actually means to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead in devotion by connecting with the Supreme Lord, who is the source of all good qualities, our own good qualities also manifest naturally. People try to cultivate good qualities. We were talking about this the other day how society sometimes wants to lift up their population by thinking of ways how to stop sinful activities in a very practical, in a very, what we say, empirical way, by developing certain mindsets. You know, you develop a right attitude or you develop a right uh, way of living. That way you can somehow or other avoid doing the wrong thing. But the mode of goodness, the mode of passion, the mode of ignorance are always in competition for supremacy. And in the mode of passion and ignorance, people commit sinful activity. In the mode of goodness, people are pious. But in this age, the mode of goodness, they say, is conspicuous by its absence. It's becoming less and less prominent and making money and enjoying the senses now become the most important thing in people's life. You might call it economic development, but it's not really economic development. It's more like getting money so you can have the, all of the things that the society says you can enjoy. So many nice things. In the year 1850, that all of the products on the market within society, in other words, anything that people could uh, get by way of either purchase or by way of activity, 95% of the products on the market were considered to be necessities. And five were considered to be, 5% were considered to be luxuries or extras. That means things you can live without. That was in the year 1850. That was a general statistic. Now in the year 2020, the numbers have actually switched. That 95% of the things on the market are considered to be not needed. You can live without and 5% is considered necessities. What are necessities? Food, clothing, place to live, and some medical needs, right? These are the things you need. And you might add education also. But of course we have spiritual education. So these are the things we need. But society now tries to develop more and more. And Srila Prabhupada said, he said, India, and he mentioned India directly, is not meant for Western material development. In other words, you can't follow the West and expect to be happy. <laughs> because the climate is different, the culture is different, the environment is different, people's consciousness are more, because if you're born in India, you've got a high birth. That means you're on the verge of going back to the spiritual world. If you take birth in the land of India, you're only one step away from going back to the spiritual world. If you take birth in the Western countries, you have a long way to go. <laughs> but if you go the other way, and you go back towards you know, material development, material happiness, then you're losing that good fortune. It's like having money and you can't spend it. <laughs> it's like a person who's rich but can't find their money. 
So if, we, if we're taking birth in Bart Bhumi, because Bart Bhumi is Punya Bhumi, and uh, Western country is Papa Bhumi. <laughs> I mean, if you can somehow or other become pious in the Western countries, you're very fortunate, not what to speak of coming to devotional service. Srila Prabhupada somehow or other picked up some Westerners, a few of us, not many, about 5,000, and turned them into Vaishnavas so they could spread Krishna consciousness around the world. But the majority of the people in Western countries are not interested in spiritual life. Where in India, it's natural. Why? Because uh, birth after birth after birth, you've been performing pious and spiritual activities. Now, when you come in contact with a pure religious movement, with you know, Srila Prabhupada's movement, pure devotional service, pure bhakti yoga, then the next stage is you you practice here, you go back home, back to Godhead. That's all. It's that easy. <laughs> Prabhupada made it so easy. Therefore, when Prabhupada first was preaching in the Western countries, one of the things that he wanted to do, and he did it, is that after he made devotees in the West, he brought them to India. He called them uh, my white elephants. <laughs> they called them my white, dan he said dancing white elephants. They were dancing white elephants. And he said, I wanted to bring the devotees that I had made in the Western countries to India to say, here, you, this is what you're chasing after, and they've given it all up. And now they're chanting and dancing and they're Vaishnavas. And this is your culture. So take a look at this. They've, they were born in rich families. Many of them were born in, you know, much opulence. Facilities for sense enjoyment was always available. Prabhupada said, in, in the Western countries, people have everything material, but they're never happy. <laughs> Why? Because they don't have Krishna, that's all. So Prabhupada came with his Western disciples to, to show the people of India, hey, this is your culture, and they're taking it up. So that was, that was Srila Prabhupada's idea. So, Krishna consciousness is before you might say when society was a little more pious, you could somehow find happiness in material life, but not no more. Not no more. It's gone. It's finished. Either you become Krishna conscious or you suffer. That's it. <laughs> That's the alternative. The alternative become Krishna conscious or you have to suffer. Because Krishna consciousness, Nitya Siddha, Krishna Prema, Saru Kabunai, Sravanadi Siddhi, Chitte, Kodiye Udai, in the hearts of all living entities, pure love for Krishna exists. It's there. It's called Gupta. It's the hidden treasure of the heart of the living entities. And it come, becomes easily awakened by a little effort, simply by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare. And taking prasadam, offering to the foodstuffs, offered to the Lord in devotion, sanctified food, which purifies the mind, gives happiness to the body and nourishment, and worshiping the Lord in his form is Archavigraha, the, the deity form of the Lord. The deity form of the Lord is an incarnation. We call it, we call it Archavigraha, incarnation. The Lord has descended in the form of his deity simply so we could dress him, we can, we can bathe him, we can feed him, we can wake him up, we put him to sleep. He becomes like our child. And for those of you who come on the outside, you see the deity, simply by seeing the deity, your mind becomes purified. Simply by taking darshan of the deity, it's a purification that comes immediately because it's Krishna. Deity is non-different than the Lord. It's absolute. So these simple processes will bring one to the highest stage of spiritual consciousness. 
which means that susukam karta bhavayam, one becomes happy. <laughs> if you want to become happy, become Krishna conscious. <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> If you want to struggle with this material world and try to make and try to organize the material energy, because you can't organize the material energy, because your the material energy is Krishna's energy. Maya Dakshena Prakriti Suyate Sacharachana. Krishna controls the material energy. We try to control the material energy, but material energy is not to be controlled by us, it's to be controlled by Krishna. So if you want to control the material energy, take shelter of Krishna, because Krishna controls the material energy. That's all. He is, yeah, he is the, uh, the absolute principle. He is Bhagavan in the sense that he is the source of everything, the maintainer of everything, the protector of all living entities, and the source of all control. That's Krishna. <laughs> So when you take shelter of Krishna, there's nothing else to, to aspire for in life. Everything is there. They say if you have Krishna, you have everything. And if you have, don't have Krishna, you have a long way to go. <laughs> in other words, you don't have anything. Krishna Mata, Krishna Pita, Krishna Dana Pran. <laughs> It doesn't mean you can't have material things, but Krishna has to be first. That's the point. <laughs> Krishna has to be first. Why? Because he is first. <laughs> if you try to take a person who's first and make him second or third, he doesn't fit. <laughs> doesn't work. This is like in the family, you know, the father is considered to be the head of the family and he is respected in that way. If he's pushed out of that position, then the whole family becomes upside down. Mm -hmm. Things don't work properly. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, things work nicely in our life when Krishna's first. And what does it mean to put Krishna first? Is that simply chant Krishna's name, hear about Krishna from Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita. Take Prashad, take food offered to the Lord in devotion. You can cook at your home, offer to your deity, or offer to a picture of the Lord. And that is also prashadam. And um, don't take food cooked by people who are materialistic, because if you do, your mind will become disturbed. Because one who commits sinful activities and cooks, the sinful, the, the karma of that sinful activities go into the food. And if you eat that food, you, you also get reactions on the sinful on that. That's a very essential part of actually purifying our existence, is to avoid food cooked by non-devotees, especially grains. Particularly grains, because karma goes into that. And sometimes you have crazy dreams. You wonder where all these crazy dreams are coming from. It's from the food. <laughs> like that. Okay, so these are some things we should think about. So the most important thing in, in this particular verse is that what is real charity? Uh, charity sometimes centers around giving some pecuniary or some some financial donation to a person in need. But real charity is to give someone something that they need that will make their life better. That is real charity. So if you can give people something that will help them and elevate them in their life, in other words, if you give them Krishna, that is the best of all charities. As much as you have Krishna, give them Krishna and you'll get more Krishna also. <laughs> when you give Krishna, you get Krishna. When you give money, you have less. <laughs> and when you give Krishna, you have Krishna, you get Krishna. Because Krishna, is uh, the way he, he is spiritual, and the more you give it spiritual, the more it becomes greater. The more you give it material, the more it becomes less. <laughs> That's the difference. So give Krishna by reminding others about who, who is their real source of happiness, Krishna. That is the best form of charity.
And if you give that kind of charity, you'll always be happy. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? <laughs> Okay, one question here. Brave Brahmachari. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj, for your class. We, after practicing uh, Krishna consciousness for a few years, mostly residents in the temple and devotees in general, so even Grahasthas, uh, even if they don't have any responsibilities still there are a lot of responsibilities in the sense um, you know like uh, he finds he or she finds uh, less time to chant and more time he has to uh, connect with devotees or do certain activities some responsibilities add up in his life that's simply due to, to the modern society we live in the fast pace of Western culture you have no time. Work, 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 right? You have maintaining the family, working, trying to get money, trying to get the material things for the household. This insurance, that insurance, this problem, you know, so many things, right? So Western society complicates things more and more because the whole Western theme is to make more and more things for people to do so people can have more and more jobs so people can make more and so they can buy more and more things and and the businesses can make more and more money so western culture is confusing it is more and more things that's all and therefore people get caught into that and then when it comes to spiritual life they're thinking well, where's the time? Keep, live simply. So try to live as simple as you can. And that's hard. But if you develop community, community makes simplicity easy to develop. If people work together in a communal way, now we have the, the whole Western, the whole Indian culture was based on community, the extended family, the, all the brothers, all of the relatives, all living together, sharing work, sharing resources, and also sharing time for spiritual practice. Now we've broken into the nuclear families where husband, wife, kids, one little box, and then the next person, and they have their box, and you have your box, and this box is over here. And everybody's paying for their own box, you know. Box means your apartment. <laughs> so community is being lost because capitalism thrives on division. The more you can divide people, the more you can sell things to people. <laughs> so you have four people in the family and you have to have four cars. <laughs> It means you have to work that much to get the money for four cars. I was, I'll give you an example. And this was in, when I was preaching in America. I was preaching in one temple and I had one friend at the temple. He invited me to come to his home. He was quite simple man, very, not very wealthy. So I came to his small little place. So I walked into the main room and there was his father who was sitting in front of a television watching some sporting event. So I thought, all right. Then I walked farther into the house and there was a curtain divided between the room where his father was and the next room. And in the next area, his brother was sitting in front of another television watching a sporting event. So, same room divided into two, two televisions, two people watching, 
two different televisions. So I thought, that's strange. Why two people, two televisions, same room, divided? Then I asked, and I thought, well, maybe they're watching different channels. But they were, they were watching the same channel. <laughs> So that really confused me. <laughs> so then I had to ask. And they said, well, you know, just in case somebody wants to change the channel, then it doesn't cause problems for the other person, you know. <laughs> so you can see how society has become so fractionalized that we divide, even within the family, people have become divided. And that's, that's a materialistic plot to sell products. That's the whole thing. It's all about breaking society into smaller and smaller groups so people buy, every person has everything. Where in community, you share resources, you share uh, labor. In other words, you work together to help each other and you keep Krishna in the center. And life becomes more, you don't work the whole year. <laughs> You work like a few year, few months a year, and whatever you produce from that few months, you can live on the whole year. And now everybody working seven days a week, or six days a week. Uh, it's just frantic. And that's, that's modern capitalistic society. It's just to squeeze people to work hard, to produce, make more products, sell more products, and who gets wealthy, all of these Big, big corporations have become billion dollar, you know, billion dollar corporations. So that's not human life. And human life is you know, simple living, God consciousness, back to the land, growing your own food, living simply, keeping cows. Now we keep cars instead of cows. <laughs> Cows are much nicer than cars, <laughs> and they're easier to maintain, easier also. <laughs> well, we, now we created this car society, right? We do, I was here, how many years ago? It was a couple of years ago. And uh, I was in Delhi last year, and uh, I was living at one very nice family, devotees. So there was a young girl in the family, she's about 14. So I know she goes to school every day, so she was home in the middle of the week. And I said, are you not going to school today? She said, no, we can't go out because the pollution level is too high, it's dangerous. They've closed the schools, we can't go out. So the pollution level, I think if it goes up to a hundred, what do they call it, that measuring device, they measure the pollution level, goes up to a hundred, it's dangerous. When I was in Bombay a couple years, it was at 530. <laughs> Couldn't even see the sun, this was in the middle of the day. <laughs> now you call that civilization? <laughs> How long can this go on? It's crazy, it's completely crazy. and it takes away from people's health. So we're not meant to live simply to make money because money is Lakshmi. And if you worship Krishna, Krishna, Lakshmi comes with Krishna, with Krishna, or with Narayan. Wherever there's Narayan, there's Lakshmi. So worship the Lord and he'll take care of you. He'll provide everything you need. You may not be rich, but you'll be happy. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just finished writing a book and based on the same idea, simple living, agriculture, cow protection, devotional communities, which we hope will be the future because these cities you can't live, after a while, they'll, they'll, be, they'll just turn into something impossible. More cars, more pollution, more crime, more sinful activities. 
This is, uh, this is the way that many of the cities in the Western countries, maybe you never go to Western countries, but things are so bad, you can't even walk on the streets at night. It's not possible. After dark, you don't go out because, you know, especially if you're women, you could get attacked, you can get robbed. There are gangs roving the streets just to take advantage of innocent people. And many of these gangs are highly armed with automatic rifles. They have wars in the cities. I'm serious. This is Western civilization. You call it civilization. There's more than 500 city gangs in America who are highly armed. Even the police don't even go near them. So this is all due to a sinful society. And when we give up Krishna, we only have one way to go, and that's down. <laughs> give up Krishna. So, of course, we're not thinking of giving up Krishna. But we have to understand there is a way to live which is conducive to the practice of spiritual life. And that is simplify your life. So based on your question, yes, people don't have time anymore for spiritual life, or they have less time, because more and more they're busy trying to keep up the pace of modern society's development. More and more and more. And what do you get? Strokes, heart attacks, cancer. These are all features of, uh, of a modern society. People are afflicted with so many diseases now. And what is the main disease? Depression. <laughs> depression causes so many problems. From depression comes all kinds of physical disease, especially cancer. When people become depressed, it actually affects the physical form and then the body also reacts and sickness develops. Therefore, people are not so healthy in as, as they used to be. People are not so healthy, they don't live as long, they're not as strong as they used to be, their memories are not as, as strong as, they, as good as they used to be. All of these are features of Kali Yuga as society develops more and more. Because material things can't make you happy. They can give you some, what we say, some support. But happiness comes with Krishna consciousness. That's where happiness is. You can't love your computer. <laughs> You might be able to use it, but you can't love it. <laughs> but what happens, you, sometimes you see now, cell phones, you see five people sitting in a restaurant, and each of is sitting, they're not talking to each other, they're looking at their cell phone. <laughs> cell phones have become now the, I was preaching in, in America, in Boston, Boston, in, uh, in called Northeastern University, a highly, you know, prestigious college, and many of the students are from India. So we gave a class, and about 75% of the students that came for our class were coming from India. They were exchange students. So we were talking about modern technology and the problems with cell phones. Cell phones cause brain damage, and they cause many other problems. And they, they cause antisocial behavior. <laughs> so at the end of the class, one young man, he was from India, he came up to me, he was in complete distress, complete distress. And he said, he said to me, he said, Swamiji, if I don't have my cell phone for six minutes, I go crazy. He wanted me to say something to kind of like tell him it's okay, <laughs> but it's not. I didn't, I didn't say that. I said, there's other ways you can find happiness in life other, <laughs> other than your cell phone. 
I mean, cell phones have some use. You call it up, you call somebody up, and then you hang up. That's it. Forget it. What else do you need? A phone is for calling. You don't have to live your whole life around the cell phone. It's like... It's me and my cell phone. Oh yeah, there's somebody else out there. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's, it's become the fetish. Now they've created... You can get everything in your cell phone. You might even get, you know... You name it, they'll put it in the cell phone. <laughs> So that is a, that's a, a, a quality or a characteristic of a very dysfunctional or, or sick society where electronics becomes the focus of everybody's attention. People are more important than things. As His Holiness Radha Swami used to say all the time, you can't love things, you can only love people. You can use things, but now we love things and use people rather than loving people and using things. Jai Sri Sri Radha Gopinath Ki Jai. So yes, people don't have time because they have been pulled into this false sense of needs. I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. Is it? So what to do? That's the answer, right? Make time for Krishna. <laughs> Maharaj, uh, we also have the cell phones and uh, we as brahmacharis... I have get... one here too. Yeah. So... It's recording my class. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> so then uh, we also spend some amount of time with the cell phone. Uh, but don't and... forget Krishna. Krishna first, cell phone somewhere down the line, but not first. <laughs> That's the point. It's not that we shouldn't have these things, but don't become absorbed in them. They don't become the way that we can find satisfaction and happiness. They have use, obviously, but they're not the source of happiness. Happiness is relationships. Happiness is based on relationships. If you have nice relationships with other living entities, you're happy. A wife wants to have a nice relationship with her husband and with her children. A husband wants to have the same. People want to have relationships with other people. That's the source of happiness in life, not machines. <laughs> So, and the ultimate relationship or the foundation for all relationships is our relationship with Krishna. That is, that relationship can never be lost. It can only be forgotten. So, when we develop a relationship with Krishna, then all of our other relationships become pleasing and happy. Because a devotee sees that relationships are based on service. We get things by serving, but serving means to give, really. Serving means to do something for someone to make them happy or to benefit them. And when you do that, you also become happy and you also become benefited. Those, they did a statistic in America, like America is always full of statistics. And this was from the secular society, had nothing to do with spirituality. They wanted to find out what are the happiest type of people in, in society. First, they, they went around to find which country in the world is the hap has the happiest people. And the first survey they did, you, would, you wouldn't believe it, the, the happiest people were Bangladesh not America, not UK, 
The happiest people were found in Bangladesh. That was the survey. It was an honest survey. <laughs> and then the, the next point was, what are the characteristics of the happiest people? And that is, they're doing something for someone else. They're serving others. And we know that. That is the culture of India. The whole culture of India is based on service, right? Just like the word thank you, right? So now we say when somebody does something for us, we say thank you. But if you go back in the history of India, there was no such thing as thank you, right? That word, that's, that's a modern thing that's come up because of Western society. People say thank you. Because in, we can say in traditional Vedic culture, if someone did something for you and you said thank you, that person would be unhappy because you're breaking the connection. I'm doing something for you for, because I'm, I'm getting something, I'm, I'm happy to do something for you and why you're saying thank you to me. You see the point? That's India's culture. Yeah. So thank you was never there. <laughs> Now, when somebody does something, we say thank you. Well, it's, I mean, it goes on, and it's, it's not like you shouldn't do it. It's just the way life is now. But in the in Vedic culture, if I did something for you, that was for my benefit. <laughs> that's how, that's, 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 that's human culture. <laughs> and that's spiritual principles. Because the whole basis of spiritual principles is based on Serving the Lord, serving others. That's the whole principle. And that's the, and so that survey, every year, they said that people are the most happiest who are busy serving others. They're the most happiest people. Not the people who are running around trying to make as much money as possible. <laughs> They're always in anxiety. <laughs> Okay, so here's a little few secular principles we can think about, <laughs> which can be understood in terms of our practice of Krishna consciousness. Because mm -hmm. here in India, you're on a you're on a marginal. Like in the West, there's a great distinction between spirituality and material life. The distinction is so clear. And it's so divided. Here, the distinction is not clear. And it shouldn't be clear. It should actually be one. But it's becoming less due to materialistic influence. That money is the honey. <laughs> money, money is not the honey. Because even if it is the honey, there's always bees stinging around the honey. So it's... In the Bhagavatam, it says that money brings 15 forms of distress. It's in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam with the song of the, song of the Avanti Brahman. 15 forms of distress that come by way of money. Envy, greed, uh, cheating, so many things. That's just a few. Lust. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's not that we're against money. Money is Lakshmi. And Lakshmi is, sits at the lotus feet of Narayan. But money, when it's used for the service of the Lord, becomes a sort of great, source of great happiness. Money used for sense gratification causes distress. But money can give us some f need. We have to have food, we have to have clothing, we have to have place to live, we have to have get certain resources that require financial uh, gain. But it's not that money brings happiness. Money brings support to a certain level, and it's also a source of happiness when it's used in the service of the Lord. Okay, anyway.
so much we could say about this. Thank you for coming. Hare Krishna. Make sure we get the guests. The guests get prasadam. They all. Everybody gets prasadam. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Shila Prabhupada ki Hare Krishna.